grace and peace to you in the name of the one who was and the one who is and the one who is to come. I'm glad that you are here. We are gathered for worship again this Sunday. It is the second Sunday after Pentecost. And yes, we are still in our own spaces, in house churches and sitting around kitchen tables and kicked back in recliners. But we are here and we trust that the Spirit still moves, that the Spirit still unites us across the distance that separates us physically right now. So, take a deep breath, settle into your space, look around where you are. This too is holy ground. As we begin our time of worship together, let us share in this call to worship, which is inspired by our Old Testament text today, Genesis 18. As Abraham welcomed the strangers, so God welcomes us. God greets us with joy and says, rest here for a while. God brings out water to wash our dusty feet. God prepares a meal to nourish our weary spirits. So let us receive the gracious hospitality of our God. Let us rest in this holy space where there is shade and water and food and laughter. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. No This morning I will be reading to you from Genesis 18 verses 1 through 15. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. 
He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourself and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seas of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of woman had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child, now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. Jesus traveled among all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, announcing the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were troubled and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the size of the harvest is bigger than you can imagine, but there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers for his harvest. He called his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to throw them out and to heal every disease and every sickness. Here are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Cananean, and Judas, who betrayed Jesus. Jesus sent out these twelve and commanded them, Don't go among the Gentiles or into a Samaritan city. Go instead to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. As you go, make this announcement. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, and throw out demons. You received without having to pay, therefore give without demanding payment. Workers deserve to be fed, so don't gather gold or silver or copper coins for your money belts to take on your trips. Don't take a backpack for the road or two shirts or sandals or a walking stick. Whatever city or village you go into, Find somebody in it who is worthy, and stay there until you go on your way. When you go into a house, say peace. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if the house isn't worthy, take back your blessing. If anyone refuses to welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet as you leave that house or city. I assure you that it will be more bearable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on Judgment Day than it will be for that city. Look, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise as snakes and innocent as doves. Watch out for people. 
because they will hand you over to councils and they will beat you in their synagogues. They will haul you in front of governors and even kings because of me so that you may give your testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Whenever they hand you over, don't worry about how to speak or what you will say because what you can say will be given to you at that moment. You aren't doing the talking, but the spirit of my father is doing the talking through you. Brothers and sisters will hand each other over to be executed. A father will, will turn his child in. Children will defy their parents and have them executed. Everyone will hate you on account of my name. But whoever stands firm until the end will be saved. Whenever they harass you in one city, escape to the next. Because I assure you, I assure that you will not go through all the cities of Israel before the human one comes. We are plopped down right in the middle of Jesus' ministry right here in Matthew's Gospel. I mean, things are getting, well, really cranked up here. If we back up a little bit, we'll remember that Jesus kind of begins his ministry after he's called his disciples by preaching the famous Sermon on the Mount. That happens in Matthew in the chapters 5 through 7. And then immediately after Jesus preaches, he goes on a healing spree. If you go back and, and look in chapter 8 and then into chapter 9, Jesus begins traveling and he begins healing everybody. <laughs> Large crowds start to follow him. He heals a man with a skin disease, a centurion's servant, Peter's mother-in-law, people who are possessed by demons, a paralyzed man, the ruler's daughter, two blind men, on and on and on. Jesus starts healing everyone. That brings us to the end of Matthew chapter 9, where we have picked up today. And in, and in these last verses of chapter 9, we see that Jesus' ministry was this. It was traveling around, teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. Listen to these verbs, church. Traveling, teaching, announcing, healing. This is what Jesus does. I love it how one preacher said that Jesus' ministry is about being both on the move and also being moved. Moved by the people that he comes across. Moved by the crowds who come into Jesus' presence and, and path. Jesus is moved by these people that he meets on the way, along the way, who are in need, sick and suffering. Listen again to Matthew 9, verse 36. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were troubled and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. At the sight of crowds that are troubled and helpless, Jesus responds with compassion. And Jesus says that the people are like sheep without a shepherd. We're, we're reading scripture, ancient texts with, with 2,020 ears, right? With, two, with 21st century ears. And sometimes it's, it's not obvious the nuance that's sort of laced in to these old texts. But for Jesus to call the crowds, <laughs> for him to compare them to, to sheep without a shepherd, it's, it's, it's a really political statement. Jesus is making. You see, because shepherd is, is a powerful symbol in Jesus' day, a powerful metaphor, almost like a king. 
But for him to say that the people are like sheep without a shepherd, it's to say that, that no one is looking out for them, that no one is helping them, that no one is hearing their cries. You see, because shepherds were the people whose duty it was to care for the sheep in their fold, to help, not harass them, to protect them. This is what shepherds did. At the sight of crowds who are desperate, in trouble, and crying out, Jesus, Jesus does not call for law and order. He calls for compassion. This is Jesus' ministry, to travel, to teach, to announce good news, to heal. Jesus calls for compassion. When we start getting into chapter 10, though, we see this. Jesus also looks out and realizes that the crowds are large. The needs are great. There's an awful lot of people who are just in need, who are sick, who are are vying for attention and, and relief and deliverance. And so Jesus acknowledges that honestly, even though he is the son of God, that all of this is more than one person can handle. And I love, love, love the pivot in the text that we've read today out of Matthew, because here's what happens. Jesus gives his disciples authority to do the ministry that Jesus himself is doing. Now, that's a big deal, right? Because essentially, y'all, the, the Messiah that we follow, the Savior that we worship, He he models sharing power and equipping other people to help. So like even though Jesus is the Son of God, it's still not all about him when it comes to the ministry. That's a powerful word. Listen to, to chapter 10, verse 1 again. Jesus calls together his 12 disciples, gives them authority over unclean spirits to throw them out, and heal every disease and sickness. He sends them out to continue the work of announcing the kingdom, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing those with disease, and throwing out demons. Yes, these disciples are handed the ministry that Jesus himself is about. And that word, that word authority matters here. Because again, Jesus, sent from God, hands over, shares the authority that God has given him with these really regular folks. Authority matters, right? Jesus doesn't hoard power or spotlight or control. He equips the 12 that he's called, and then he sends them out. You know, we know that feeling of of being given true authority or not, right? Like, we've all been there when someone asked us to do something but didn't actually hand over the keys and let us do it the way we we would have done it. Like, we know there's people, right, who who still kind of have to, like, keep a stronghold and, and still control whatever it was. I mean... A a tiny, silly example of this is we all have this person in our families or our friend circles, that person who might ask somebody to load the dishwasher, but then is probably going to go back and reload it the proper way, right? We we all have those people, right? We we might be those people. Uh, I, this story and, and Jesus handing over authority reminds me of my third year of seminary. 
And so it was the fall of 2010, and I was an intern at Chester United Methodist Church in Chester, Virginia, which was about 20 miles south of Richmond, outside the city, a suburb, really. And I had, I had by chance, gotten connected with this fantastic senior pastor who had been serving there for a long time, Pastor Marg. And she was seasoned. I mean, she, she, she was a veteran. Like, this was 10 years ago, and I, she was in her 60s then. And, uh, you know, here I am, uh, bebopping along, tw- 25 years old, third-year seminary student. And she was so, so gracious and such a fantastic mentor for me that year. And, you know, I, I it, it's funny, I, confidence has not really been a thing that I, that I lack a whole lot in life, but I knew enough to know when I was going into this scene as a pastoral intern, I, I, I knew enough to know that I had a whole lot to learn, right? And so mostly my posture was kind of, kind of speak when you're spoken to, follow directions, but Marg was the kind of pastor and leader who always treated me so seriously. I, I remember a few instances of this. There was one moment where we were uh, getting ready for worship, and something, a conflict had come up in the church. And she was kind of filling me in on the details of it. And then she looked at me and she said, well, what do you think? What would you do? And I remember thinking, shoot if I know. Like, you're, you're asking me? Again, she, she spoke to me like I was a colleague, even though next to her I, I felt like a peon, right? She gave me my first robe, my, my first preacher's robe. And it was one that she had had when she was young, and I think in seminary. And I remember feeling so special when she gave this robe to me. I, for one thing, I didn't expect to wear a robe in worship. I, I'd never worn one before, and, and she, she said to me, well, we, you know, her and the associate, we wear robes, you're going to wear a robe. And, and she gave me that robe, and I remember the first day I put it on as we were about to process into worship. And I, I remember feeling different. Uh, it felt like she was giving me authority. And then finally, the, the, well, the other things stick out, but there was this one moment. It was in, it was in December. Uh, a longtime member of the church, her husband died. It was in this cold snap in December, real cold. And Marg took me with her to go and visit this woman, she let me just sort of observe her as she as she visited with this with this person who was grieving and and the the woman all she wanted was a real simple graveside service and so when it ca- came time to plan that service and get ready for it Marg asked me to be there she also asked me to take a a small portion of the service and and I, I, I honestly remember saying, Mar, you know, I, I don't have to. Like, really, it's, it's okay. And she was like, no, no, no. No, this is, this is what we do, and, and, and this is how you learn. And, and, and she let me do a part of this holy, holy, sacred service, a woman who had lost her beloved. And I remember thinking, gosh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't deserve this, but... But my, my teacher, my mentor, my rabbi, in a sense, was saying to me, no, you, yes, you do. You were here for this work. You were equipped for this work. Take this authority. Yeah, you. And I did. I did. And I've never forgotten that. Yeah, you. (laughs) Jesus hasn't stopped gathering, calling, and commissioning disciples to continue his work. He hasn't stopped seeing the crowds out there who are desperate and crying out for help and being moved 
compassion. Jesus hasn't stopped looking at us, his church, his body, his hands, his feet, his presence in the world, and saying, yeah, you. You're the ones who have authority now. So go. Announce the kingdom. Cure the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers and cast out demons. You have the authority. Yeah. You. Let us turn our hearts to God now as we join in prayer. Gracious creator, we were yours before we drew breath, and still we will be yours when the pulse of life ceases. In every fragile, reckless moment, we belong to you. We marvel at the ways that you give us to each other. You bless us with bonds of kinship that we have no right to claim. And so we thank you for friends and family and neighbors who light the way for us, who speak the truth in love, who continue to hope even when we give them little reason to do so. Holy God, may our gratitude for their steady presence make us quick to welcome, to forgive, and to set more places at your table. We pray for those who are losing hope because of joblessness or loneliness, persistent pain, powerful addiction, or crippling isolation. We pray for soldiers who cannot rest and civilians who cannot heal Abolish war from the land. Make your children lie down in safety. Merciful God, we pray that you would widen the circles of our concern, that you would widen our compassion. Your ways are not our ways, but you call us to be part of your peculiar family. Grant us the courage to be odd, in a world so afraid of difference. We pray for your children whom we label and keep at a distance, the homeless, the alien, the terrorist, the felon, 
our categories are legion. Redeeming God, stake your claim on us now until we hear your gospel echo in each complicated story and see your image shining from every broken and blessed face. We pray these prayers in the name of Jesus, who unsettles our lives for the sake of your love, and who still teaches us to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It feels strange. <laughs> I had to go find these. They were up front. <laughs> feels weird holding it, but this way that we were used to receiving our offerings week after week, something as, as basic as passing a plate around, right? And, and now we wonder when we'll ever receive an offering this way again. Nevertheless, this is a season when we are constantly reminding ourselves that even though we aren't doing things in the same way that we've been used to doing them. We are still doing them. <laughs> and that includes offering our prayers and our presence and our gifts and our service in ministry. Friends, we cannot help but become like what we worship. We bring our gifts this day as a sign that we worship not what we hoard in our pockets, but the one who is revealed in the act of self-giving. This day, like we do all Sundays, let us offer our lives in joy. Amen. So now we leave this space of worship. And while so much of the road ahead is uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is there, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet again. Go in peace.